Oh my. One of my colleagues called me about 11 a.m. on Friday morning, just after the Supreme Court released their decision overturning Roe v. Wade. And he said, as far as I can tell, a third of my people are going to be celebrating, a third of my people are going to be weeping, and a third of my people are going to be desperately hoping we don't talk about this at all. I don't know the proportions here at St. Luke's, but I do know that we have people in all three of those spheres. I've heard from women who are feeling this decision in their bodies and are physically sick over this decision. I've heard from LGBTQ folk who feel that their right to marriage or their intimate relationships could be next. I've heard from men who just don't know what to say. And others who would remind us that there are loving Christians on both sides of this issue. So in this time when emotions are running the gamut and some are celebrating this decision and some are just feeling raw, please don't assume that your fellow parishioner is feeling what you are feeling. Every one of us needs to feel whatever it is that we need to feel. People need their fears and concerns to be heard. And we can do an incredible service by listening deeply to one another's perspective and to one another's experience. We just need to remember that others may not share our perspective or our intensity. I don't think this is the time or the place to unpack this decision and all of its ripple effects. As my colleague also noted, lots of people are offering lots of words. And the space where people are pouring words right now is well occupied. Might our task be in a different direction today. So when I just don't know what else to do, I turn to the text and see how they might illuminate what we and the world are living through. The gospel sure is puzzling. First off, Jesus has set his face to go to Jerusalem. He has no illusions about what awaits him there. Intense conflict, division, false accusations, raw power, the cross. He passes through a village of Samaritans. From the perspective of the Jews, the Samaritans are the hated other. But they don't receive him because his face is set for Jerusalem. His disciples entertain commanding fire to come down from heaven and consume them. But Jesus turns and rebukes them. So if you are feeling the urge to rain down fire on somebody just now, Jesus says, not so fast. They go on to another village, and along the road someone professes, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replies, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus, I'll follow you anywhere. Really, Jesus says? The world gives you holes and nests and tribes and labels and certainty and simplistic reductions but I don't lay my head in any of those places. To follow me is to go into the land where you listen with your heart and meet the real human being on the other side. To another, Jesus says, follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. 
But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. I'm always puzzled over these instructions. They just don't make sense. But in the middle of Friday night, when I just couldn't sleep, I heard something I hadn't heard before. Maybe Jesus is saying, whatever seems most urgent to you, whatever it is that you think you have to do right now, you have to come follow me first. You have to ground yourselves in me first. Or you won't be building the kingdom of God, but just one more edifice to power and control. And with an angry, volatile heart, what you build is highly likely to increase the violence and deepen the wound you seek to heal. Yes, there is work to do, but we must center ourselves first or we'll be lost. This particular moment in which we live, it is a tricky, tricky moment. And there are lots of places that we can lose our way. Jesus is bidding us to follow him before setting out on a course of action. And Galatians is loaded with advice we need just now. The first two paragraphs are pure gold. Hear Paul again. For freedom, Christ has set you free, set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. There are a thousand ways that our freedom can enslave us. Freedom that is self-indulgent isn't freedom. Freedom absent the capacity to consider the other. Freedom without the capacity to yield to the other. Freedom without love of neighbor, understanding that your neighbor is inextricably tied to your very own being. Freedom without this love of neighbor at its core isn't freedom but is simply the exercise of power that bites and devours others. Freedom not tempered by love is its own form of hell, enslaving both the other and us to a life of bondage. This is not the abundant life that Jesus promises us or desires for us. Galatians goes on to delineate between the works of the flesh and the works of the spirit, calling us to shed the former and seek the latter. It's interesting, there are 15 works of the flesh. Six are the hot ones. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, sorcery, drunkenness, carousing. But nine deal with the realm of enmity and division and the idols we make out of our rightness. These are idolatry, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy. There is much more time spent on things that destroy relationship and community then there is concern about those hot sins. 
we really need to think about this right now. Where are we tempted to the works of the flesh that erase the dignity of other human beings, casting them as the other whom we cannot abide? Instead, we are to live by the Spirit and be guided by the Spirit and manifest the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Paul reminds us that there is no law against such things. In our country, at a time when tensions are as high as I have ever seen them, we need these fruits of the Spirit now more than ever. Can we immerse ourselves in these and move out from there? I don't know what the days ahead will hold or how the Spirit may work in your heart, call you to respond, and move you to action. But I do want to circle back to a vision for our community that we tried to live into a long, long time ago. Our country was well into the Iraq War. And people in St. Luke's were really at odds over policy and feeling called to really different courses of action in response to policy decisions. I posed this question then. Could we trust that one person, after doing their scripture study and praying, and being in conversation with Jesus and with the wider community might be called to go protest in the Capitol. And another might be called to write a letter of support to the president. And could we see both actions as the work of the Spirit? Could we support both people in the actions that they felt called to take? Could our community be that generous with one another? Just for the record, that sermon had both conservatives and liberals really mad at me. (laughs) But I wondered that then, and I wonder that now. And I believe that with every fiber of my being. Can we commit to one another that we will stay at this table together and be crystal clear that all are welcome to come here and be nourished by Jesus' very own body and life? None of us hold the whole truth on anything. And all of us need to be transformed from the inside out by him. Can we lay down our lives for one another and drink in his life knowing that his life always enlarges our vision and expands our hearts? We come to this rail shoulder to shoulder with one another. We partake of communion with Jesus and with one another, and we never leave the same as when we came. I don't know where we go from here, but if today's gospel is any indication, that is precisely where the Son of Man who has nowhere to lay his head has planted his presence. So take heart, Follow him above all else. Leave the enmities and works of the flesh behind. Cultivate the fruits of the Spirit and trust that you will be guided by the Spirit as we all continue to set our face 
toward Jerusalem. 